Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome. I'm uh, John Comel, chair of uh, uh, the Power Authority, and pleased uh, to have all of you join us for our, our July uh, board meeting. With me is uh, a majority of our board, Trustees Cress, uh, Balboni, Pacente, and McCandry. Uh, Trustees uh, Trainer and McKibben uh, are unable to join and otherwise excused. And as always, over the course of our next couple hours, uh, Gil and his team uh, will join us and impart their information, wisdom, and uh, perspective. Um, as always, uh, we need to uh, start with uh, a motion to adopt uh, the, the uh, agenda uh, for today. The meeting's been duly noticed and uh, otherwise complies with uh, Robert's Rules of Order. So if we can have a motion to uh, approve, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, and all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion uh, carries. As we typically do, uh, we have a few matters to discuss uh, in executive session before we resume in public session. So I'd ask for a motion to conduct uh, such a session uh, to discuss the appointment of a particular person and other relevant matters. So moved. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, motion carried. Uh, thank you very much. We'll be back to you shortly in open session. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, as you can now see, we have a, a full squad turnout, so uh, welcome uh, one and all. Always uh, great to see uh, everyone and appreciate your uh, continuing efforts on the behalf of many. Um, if I could uh, ask for a motion to uh, resume our meeting in open session. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. And as always, uh, no votes were taken uh, during executive session. In terms of uh, our contractors uh, list and any conflicts, we've all been polled in advance. Any updates, changes, revisions? Uh, if there are none, super. First item uh, on our agenda is our uh, consent agenda, which was uh, full and robust uh, as usual. Uh, before our, uh, we have a little bit of discussion there, if I could have a motion to approve uh, the consent agenda as presented. So moved. Second. Second. All right. Um, I do want to spend a couple minutes uh, on uh, a couple of the items. Uh, um, one in particular, uh, Gil, Keith, uh, in terms of recharge in New York and the annual compliance uh, review. I know we've seen evidence in the past. Um, always applaud the accountability and the diligence uh, and the discipline uh, that we employ and expect uh, from those who benefit. Um, you rattled through a number of non-compliant uh, organizations. I don't know, Keith, can you just embellish a bit there as to sure. the trend or how you see things uh, moving or going the right direction, the wrong direction? It was a typical uh, outcome or atypical? So it is atypical from what we've seen historically in the program. I think the good news, um, as I presented to you last year, is that the uh, number of jobs reported and the number of and the amount of capital uh, investment reported versus contractual commitments e exceed um, you know the the commitments by 122 percent respectively for jobs and 155 percent for capital investment on a programmatic basis. So in the aggregate, in the we're aggregate, doing well. The, the program is doing the extremely well. Devils in the well. details. Yes. And at that level of noncompliance, our interaction, what's the your perspective there on? It's uh, actually consistent with what we've seen historically. It's 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 pretty low actually. Okay, so overall, very pleased with the uh, the direction. The program continues to be effective. Okay. Um, we're all, you're also asking us to, for approval on some of these procurement services and other you know contracts where there's a lot rolled in. Uh, so, you know, Jan John, Daniela, you've got you know a number of service providers there. Anything out of the ordinary? Anything atypical um, in any of that? No, no, very similar. No, Chairman, similar to what we've done in the past. Okay, and John, the same. That's correct. Okay. All right, great. Can I ask a question before we leave this? Sure. So Keith, I know in the past um, that. You've created um, a really wonderful document that shows all of the investments, the resulting jobs, the economic impact, and so I'm assuming that that's being compiled again. Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. And Joe, in terms of EPRI, um, 
you know, it's talked about here, uh, you know, as our membership fees, as we've talked about it historically, it's really an, an R&D arm for us, or it's almost a, a little bit of an outsourced R&D effort. Right. Am, am I reading that correctly? Exactly. So, you know, the, the, the EPRI was, um, is a collaboration of a number of utilities, so we're able to leverage our R&D dollars by um, participating with a number of different uh, industry leaders in research of common interest. Um, so <coughs> they were formed after uh, the, the um, blackout in 1965. Uh, they really went into effect about 1972, early 70s. And for about three decades, we've been a member. And as part as a membership, uh, we're able to focus our research dollars into key focus areas of the industry and uh, share share knowledge with them and, and get the benefit, the aggregate benefit of and all the research. leverage others exactly. so our return is meaningful. Right. So, you know, rather than focusing on our own uh, kind of, you know, we have a lot of assets in our fleet, but uh, in aggregate in the industry, we're able to leverage thousands of other assets and the data behind that to, to make good decisions. So this is much more than a uh, lunch and dinner social exactly. club. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. This is a, and actually we require participation of our of our the, uh, folks that are members and, and part of the uh, collaboration, whether on advisory committees or in some of the uh, sectors, research sectors. Uh, it's actually part of our employees' performance to make sure that they're they're participating in uh, on, in producing. You got okay. a couple of quick examples of uh, sure. RDs. Stuff so from a uh, from a programmatic standpoint, probably the biggest winner we had in history is um, the static compensator we have in, in Clark. Um, that was an investment that we did uh, based on some research we did with EPRI, uh, where we were able to capture without uh, additional transmission investments, but working on um, some electronics, power electronics in our Utica facility, uh, to capture and realize some uh, value from the transmission constraints in the system. So for example, that that uh, investment for us was about a $54 million job back in the day, and we've realized over 124 million dollars uh, of those constrained costs um, for the benefit of the organization. Uh, I would say more from a programmatic standpoint, there's, a, a, like I said, there's a lot of, uh, of uh, equipment out there that we can leverage the, the knowledge base and the, and the profiles of that uh, equipment for our own eye socket, for our own smart uh, maintenance and diagnostics. So one example is uh, we use dis uh, dissolved gas analysis for our transformers. But even though we have a, a significant fleet of transformers in aggregate, it's a small relative to industry, we're able to leverage everybody's dissolved gas analyses and profiles through this research wing um, to, to do that. And a, probably a more recent example is our ISOC, having some of the smart M&D uh, information come into our ISOC. We we've, we've, uh, have some case studies now that have saved about $20 million um, just in some deferred maintenance and some uh, changes in the way we do things. Um, and they've been a big collaborator on uh, some of the analytics behind that as well. So it's a relatively small investment for the actual return. Yeah, I think we, I think absolutely. I think the return we get is uh, far exceeds the investment. But do they have a good golf outing? Oh, I've never <laughs> been to one, oh, so okay. I don't know. Better answer, better answer yet. So okay. All right. Any other questions uh, relative to items on the consent agenda? Otherwise, they ask for. Uh, all in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, the consent agenda carries. All right. With that, uh, Gil, uh, jumpstart us, kick us off, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, trustees, uh, my colleagues, and, and the public. Uh, we are almost halfway. Um, in in our year, and uh, let me give you a half a, a mid uh, halftime update of where we are. I'm pleased to report that all the arrows are pointing the right way, and we're green in all of our key performance indicators uh, year to date. You will hear um, some more detail on on our financial performance from Lee Garza our operational performance from Joe Kessler and, and Sarah Salati will uh, discuss the commercial aspects of this scorecard. But nevertheless, uh, we are in a good place and we're trending towards having a good year this year. Uh, kudos, I mean, that's, that's worthy and uh, yeah. you know, certainly needs to be acknowledged, so. Uh, and and it's, it's a credit to, to our team uh, for really doing a great job both in uh, the New York Power Authority and in canals uh, management and our union. I suggest you might have to bump those targets next <laughs> Exactly. Uh, okay. Maybe. 
six months. I thought you would be excited yeah, about the I'm dirt rain. Yeah, I'm all teased. Well, yeah, I was going to save that for Joe. <laughs> twice now. We've got green on the dirt. So. Now, let me talk about two very important events that occurred uh, in this legislative session with regard to the New York Power Authority. Um, for a very long time, this is probably the first time our authority, our legal authority and scope uh, has been expanded. So there are four areas and, and the, of, of importance. One is now we can build transmission lines beyond New York waters, so basically into federal waters. We now have that legal authority. Uh, we can supply electricity to all government buildings, so not just government buildings in New York City and Westchester County, but all government buildings across our state, uh, the you know, state buildings, counties, cities, towns, and villages. So it's a, it's a, it's really a um, an increase in our ability to provide low cost and renewable renewable power to public buildings across the state. And you'll see the term there: CCAs. Those are called community choice aggregators. These are communities that band together and decide we want to buy our own green power. So, for example, in Westchester County, the, you know, the, the towns and villages here banded together into a community choice aggregation group, and we can supply those, uh, those customers. So that is a, a significant um, enhancement of our authority. We are also now can pilot financing, providing debt financing to renewables, both large-scale renewables and distributed or smaller scale renewables. And so we're going to, to pilot those uh, as we go forward and implement our strategy. The last area is in EV. If you recall, electric vehicle and mobility is one of our moonshots. In the past, we can only build charging stations at public facilities. Now we can, we have the authority to build charging stations at both public and private facilities across our state. So as we put fast chargers between 50 and 70 miles of our highway corridors here in the state, we now have more options to optimally place those fast charging stations uh, across New York. Another very uh, important legislation that was passed is called the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Uh, if you recall, the governor introduced a sweeping energy and environmental bill as part of his uh, uh, budget, uh, and that then got uh, uh, negotiated with the legislature, and they came up with the uh, CLCPA. In that bill, it says that New York State will have 70 percent of its electricity supply produced by renewable energy by 2030. And by 2040, we will have carbon-free electricity, meaning uh, we will produce electricity from carbon-free uh, fuel, no longer fossil fuels. And by 2050, our state will have a 100 percent or net zero in terms of greenhouse gas emission, which means that that's economy-wide, not just the electric sector. So these are not only, uh, uh, you know, they're significant because they're nation-leading. New York now it has the most uh, aggressive and most progressive goals when it, when it comes to combating climate change. Um, there are some specific uh, goals that are noteworthy to mention. Our state also will target 9 gigawatts or 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind by 2035 off the coast of Long Island and New York City, uh, 6 gigawatts or 6,000 megawatts of distributed solar by 2025, 3 gigawatts or 3,000 megawatts of energy storage by 2030, and a very, very aggressive energy efficiency goal of reducing energy consumption in our state by 185 trillion BTU by 2025. Again, um, you know, this is just a, a 
you know, we're, we're leading, our state is leading from the front under our governor's leadership, and there's a lot of work to do behind this. In fact, there are councils and working groups and committees that were stipulated in the legislation that have to be formed to operationalize these goals. And we are a member of at least two of those statutory committees and, and councils. We're very, very excited. It's aligned with our strategy. Not, not coincidentally. Yeah, not coincidentally. Enab enabling legislation. Absolutely. Oh. This, is, this is really enables, uh, creates the environment for us to be able to execute on the strategy that we've been on. Uh, the next step for us is to uh, finalize the strategy that we've been working on. As you know, we, we've been uh, creating a new strategy for NIPA. NIPA, we're calling it NIPA 2030. Um, our previous strategy was NIPA 2020, which is around the corner. And in the fall, you will see the first version of that strategy, and it will be aligned with our state's goals. So we're very, very excited, uh, and we, we, you know, we're, everybody's working hard on it. Yeah, well done, you, Justin and team, well yeah. done, and uh, putting the pieces of the puzzle together to further enable the success. And offshore wind already come into place. So yep, yeah, and, and I will, I will. I assume you, Sarah, will talk yeah, a little bit over, about. I'll right. save for, for Sarah, because uh, Sarah and her team led that effort. Yeah. And uh, but yes, and uh, and also the energy storage that we're that you will have in your item that Joe will be presenting is you know part of this initiative as well. But that's all I have. Okay. Uh, no red flags at this point as you look ahead to the back half of the year. Anything that uh, is of concern from your seat? No, um, I, I think we just got to execute well for the next uh, half of this year. Uh, prices are still soft. You'll hear that from uh, Sarah. Uh, there's plenty of water, but prices are soft. So, um, but our, our assets are performing well. Our transmission system is performing well. Our construction projects are, are performing well in terms of their budget and schedule. So it's, it's about executing our strategy between now and the end of the year, just continuing to be focused uh, in, in our day-to-day -day operations and make sure we provide safe and reliable power to the state. Okay. Can I ask Thank a you. Yep. Yep. So obviously New York's um, leading the nation and NYPA is leading, uh, you know, power authorities. Are you being contacted by other states sort of asking about, especially now with the expanded authorities, how do we do this? Um, yep. And, and, you know, a lot of states are, are, uh, have their own plans, not not as ambitious as ours. Uh, some are developing their plans and trying to learn from us. You know, how did you do this or did you do that? How did you get stakeholders to agree? Uh, absolutely, I think you know. Aside from uh, this historic legislation, our governor also led a coalition of states called the U.S. Climate Alliance. So about 25, 26 states have banded together and say, we are going to continue and uh, pursue and meet the Paris Agreement. And so 25, 26 states, about 60% of the GDP of the U.S. So there's, a, there's really, uh, um, uh, New York really is the leader in this area. I think just echoing the chairman's comments, not just about New York State, but about NIPA, that sometimes we're so busy looking outside of ourselves, we don't see that this is the leader that other folks are looking to. So well done. Thank you. Any other questions for Gil? All right, super. Thanks. Lee, uh, catch us up on how the, the math is adding up. <laughs> Looks like the trend is uh, encouraging. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is beginning to feel like um, the same record, but in a very good way. So the hits just keep on coming. The hits just keep on coming. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, trustees, members of the public, and fellow colleagues. Uh, as I've done in the past, I'm going to give you an update on our year-to-date financial performance through May and also give you a snapshot into what the end of the year is looking like. Uh, the key takeaway continues to be that um, during both time periods, we're performing ahead of budget. So with that, let me give you a brief, whoops, much too far. I do not want to give the commercial presentation right now. Um, 
So let me start out with our year-to-date performance through Maine. Uh, for the first five months of the year, our net income was $45.7 million, uh, $22.9 million higher than budget, so effectively doubling what our budget is. Uh, the positive variance was driven um, by $21.3 million in lower generation margins and more than offset by $25 million in lower operating expenses and $19 million in lower net interest expenses. Uh, the negative generation margin variance is driven by lower than budgeted energy and capacity prices, uh, which exceeded the effect of uh, our greater than budgeted hydro generation um, and was also uh, tempered um, the negative variance by, by favorable variances in hedge settlements and fuel monetizations in NIPA's fossil fleet. Uh, and this negative variance in generation is expected to reverse by year end, which you'll see in the, in the full year projection. Uh, the $25 million positive operating expense variance uh, is driven by the timing of spending for several large projects at Niagara and St. Lawrence, uh, including the uh, Niagara Gorge Corridor project, inspection of the conduit intake tubes at Niagara, and concrete surface rehabilitation at St. Lawrence. Uh, there's also been some lower site maintenance O&M at the Zeltman plant, uh, and uh, we also expect these variances uh, to reverse by year-end, uh, effectively the timing of expenses here. Uh, the $19 million positive net interest expense variance is driven by three factors. Uh, the first of those being favorable mark-to-market gains on our substantial investment portfolio due to lower interest rates, uh, postponement of debt issuances that had originally been scheduled uh, to fund some CapEx investments that we believe we can uh, further postpone issuing so we don't have those negative, uh, negative expenses associated with having to pay interest, and lower interest rates and lower outstanding borrowings on our commercial paper program. So to, but, I'm sorry, go ahead. Just to clarify, so we're making sure I'm following. So we're missing on the operating line by 40 million, but we're making that up uh, by more than 70 million on, on the interest line. Um, Am I math correctly here? Are you are you referring to the column furthest on the right? Yes. Those are the budgeted actual numbers, not the variance numbers. So uh, net operating income. Uh, year to date uh, was budgeted to be $72.4 million in total. So those are total numbers that uh, that would have appeared in the budget uh, from December. And it's actually 26.6? And it's actually, uh, it's, it is favorable above the 72.4 oh, by 26.6. So effectively the addition of those two. Got it. Okay. I'm sorry. Any other question? Um, I'm sorry. No. All right. Okay. Let me move on to the to the full year forecast then. So for the full year forecast, um, we expect net income to be 38.3 million dollars. Uh, 17. It's effectively 17 and a half million dollars higher than budget. Uh, the positive variance to budget is driven by. Uh, just a touch under $18 million, million in lower net interest expense, uh, $6.7 million in higher non-utility margins, uh, $6 million higher in transmission margins, and $2.6 million positive variance, a nominal uh, positive variance in margin generations. Uh, this is offset by uh, $15.9 million uh, negative variance in operating expenses, and, and I'll, I'll describe each of these. Uh, right now. So the positive net interest expense variance is due to the same three factors that I pointed out year to, on the May year to date. We continue to see um, favorable variances being generated on our investment portfolio due to lower interest rates. Uh, lower than budgeted interest expenses will carry through the year and lower outstanding borrowings on our commercial paper. All of those benefits will continue, we expect to continue carrying throughout the year. So we, we view those to be um, sustainable. Uh, the operating expenses, uh, the negative variance is primarily driven by post-employment benefit expenses, an increase in, in those expenses, as well as increased site O&M. Uh, so if you will notice 
uh, the $15.9 million negative variance. That fully reflects the reversal of some of the pos uh, of some of the expenses at the first half of the year that I had identified that had not occurred that we're picking up again in the second. And in addition to that, some incremental uh, 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 post-employment benefits that uh, that we're foreseeing right now. Why would we have had trouble for or planning for that? For that, uh, is that just an actuarial ca calculation? It's an, it's so an actuarial, and, and we typically aren't getting estimates for the full year until about about this midway point. So, it's uh, something that we're endeavoring to become better in our forecasting. But but part of it also is the way the actuarial process runs. So we don't need better actuaries. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. I'll hold. I'll reserve my opinion. Right. The swings in the margins are pretty significant than from May. So how how confident are you that you're going to be able to make that up? So we continue to see lower, sustained lower energy and uh, capacity prices. So that's a trend we expect to continue through year end. Um, the, the swing in margins is being driven by hydro generation. So that we believe we have um, much better visibility into forecasting given the water flows that we can actually see and anticipate coming through our large hydro facilities. So these all result in it's it's effectively all market risk. So mm -hmm. I think we can acknowledge that. But if there were one of the two elements, prices in the market versus quantities of uh, of water coming through our plants, I I feel safer uh, or more confident that we'll see the quantities than. Uh, than a recovery in price. Volume. We're making it up in Who's volume. Rate, we're making it up in volume. That's right. And where do we see the market uh, look as you look longer term? I mean, is this the new normal? Um, what's your, your perspective on that? In, in the short term, I believe, and what we're seeing is these lower sustained prices are, are likely to continue. Maybe not at this depressed level, but the the trend is for is for. I would say, and I would ask Sarah's, Sarah's input as well, I would say uh, effectively flat versus versus a full reversal. And we've seen this trend through bouts of a very cold winter, through bouts of a heat wave, as we can probably right. all right. recall here very recently. So um, it is it is a trend that is not exclusive to the New York ISO that, that the rest of the country is experiencing as well. And where are we with water levels, uh, Gil? What's the, you know, the update? I mean, it continues to get a lot of media attention, um, whether it's uh, flood damage, whether it's <clears throat> availability, et cetera. I mean, we're benefiting from higher water levels, higher volume. W what's the update there? The commission uh, that's under fire for navigating water levels up north and all the rest of that. Can you bring us current on any of that? Yeah, I would just, uh, I mean, from a market perspective, I would share that we are higher in terms of the, the water volumes, whether that actually is able to be translated into generation uh, revenue is another story. What we've seen was there was a higher um, than an anticipated kind of melting, right, the freshet, which is essentially the ice pack that comes into the rivers. And uh, NIPA responds to the River Authority uh, when it requests that we uh, divert or do not send as many flows through our generation assets in order to avoid flooding. So that um, that ha was uh, did have an impact on us and has a year to date relative to actually converting the increased volumes into a negative a negative impact impact in the sense that we have more than enough water, but it's not necessarily translating into generation monetized value for, for NIPA because we have been supporting uh, the, uh, the, the river authority to control the, the water flows so that um, residents are not being flooded. Well, the, the overall, the macro, we are above the long-term average, yeah. you know, in terms of water flow. We're above the long-term average. Uh, so that's one, and and the so and we get the the benefit of that since we generate power uh, for additional uh, additional water that's available to us. A completely separate issue is that the flooding in in uh, the shores of Lake Ontario and along the Saint Lawrence River, uh, the governor actually formed a a commission. I'm, I'm a member of that commission working with the local communities to figure out how those communities can build better, more resilient 
designs so that you know this is kind of like the new normal that that those communities can uh, deal with uh, high water levels like what we're having uh, in this season and also back in 2017. Yeah, but generally, um, and I know that I'm not, I will get up and share it with uh, my commercial report, but the, the higher water flows are not necessarily translating into, into the, the revenues, mainly because the power prices are lower. We just haven't seen the level of demand that was anticipated. We had a milder spring, as you recall, and uh, we have in the last couple of weeks had some spikes in terms of with the heat waves, but we're looking at, at year-to-date uh, numbers here. And, uh, and uh, the, the prices have not been as robust as we would have anticipated for the margin at, at, at our hydros in particular. And Joe, when we talk about making it up on fire, then what we're moving from what percentage to you know that percentage plus in terms of capacity, or I mean, or I mean a little bit, or am I missing it in terms of we're making it up in volume in terms of producing more power, more water? So, so, so right now, for example, uh, in uh, Messina, uh, every unit would be available, and we're gonna, we're going to generate with all of it. But even with that, we still have to spill some of the water. So basically, it's we got headroom on the amount of water we're using anyway. So, uh, uh, Sarah's team is able to bid all the capacity that the plant has to offer. We we scheduled our maintenance around this time to make sure that we have mm -hmm. the, those units available, so that if we we can, we'll take every bit of generation we can, and uh, so we've, we've collaborated with her team to make sure we're doing that. So we're passing, we're probably on the order of about 900 megawatts at San Lawrence um, right now, which and is Niagara. Really capacity. Niagara is a, is a little bit different story. Um, uh, they have some flexibility because of the pump plant. So we're able to pump and store when we need to. So the uh, ICAP or the capacity they have for a four hour limit is still around 2,670 megawatts. And we are routinely uh, able to achieve that if they need us. Okay. So yes, we have, again, the, the assets are performing well. Again, it's a question of the demand in the market. And in, in addition, we've seen some congestion around Niagara and Zone A as a result of some upgrades that are being undertaken on the transmission grid back uh, in that area, specifically al along the 340 KV. That's something that's anticipated to continue until 2022, uh, which will then kind of debottle that that area. What we're seeing generally in the market again is is an increase in influx, obviously, of renewables, and that's coming across the state, and that's having an impact on on, on the margins and on on the market prices. Okay. Which then, to that point, makes the expanded authority that's been given to NIPA all the more important going forward. Yes, yes, that gives us an opportunity to continue to place um, both uh, with our economic development programs, uh, our hydropower and bilateral contracts, as well as uh, supporting uh, passing through market power as well to existing and new customers. And to put, I mean, and to put this into some context, just from a hydro generation standpoint, everything I completely agree and fully aligned with everything that Sarah and Joe said. Um, we're seeing right now in our forecasting on the order of 15 percent plus increased in water flow to just put that in some in some percentage perspective let me just touch on two last things and then i'll conclude my comments um we do see positive non-utility margins and these are driven by higher than budgeted customer energy solutions revenues and in very large part attributable to an increase um in the performance financial performance of our energy efficiency business and lastly, uh, related to transmission, uh, we see about $6, uh, $6 million positive variance there associated with um, higher margins from our Hudson transmission project, and also the implementation of NIPA's annual transmission revenue requirement uh, that always goes into effect mid-year uh, and specifically July 1st. Uh, so with that, let me, let me wrap up my comments and open it up to any, any final questions. Anything else uh, for Lee? Good discussion around all that. Good tee up for Sarah. All right, thanks very much, Lee. Thank you. We covered a portion of your. Oh, we did, I know, exactly. I should just sit down. <laughs> Build off of that as you deem appropriate. Sure. Uh, well, I think that this is reflective. Again, it's nothing that you haven't heard year to date in terms of our performance. Again, the generation is higher than anticipated by 6% year to date through May, although the electricity prices are 21% lower than, than when we set the budget in Q4. 
you know, we continue to hope with the with the heat waves and things for that the prices will come up to to catch up on some of what we lost in the first half of the year relative to the budget. At this point, going forward, with the the forwards as of for that matter, the end of July, which every day in, in our group we're updating those. Uh, this uh, I anticipate that that we will probably be slightly below on the merchant uh, gross margin relative to budget, but we'll remain within the probabilistic range that we set forward in the beginning of the year. So we could stay stay tuned on that. Again, we touched a little bit about economic development and our program and the effectiveness of that in terms of the retention of jobs and the commitment of capital across the state. Keith will share with you some additional items for approval after I speak on energy efficiency. That was also something that was just flagged by Lee. We're ahead of schedule in terms of our budget as it, as it relates to customer investments and the fees that we secure off of those relative to the timing. And our operating expenses are, are slightly off just due to some uh, one-time non-recurring charges. But again, uh, we completed um, somewhat of a reorg in the clean energy solutions business and, and are beginning to see uh, some uh, results as from that. <clears throat> then what's most exciting to talk about in building off of what Gil was sharing is uh, NIPA's first foray into the offshore wind industry. As you know, Governor Cuomo established the 2035 target of nine gigawatts of power and just announced a couple of weeks ago uh, the largest renewable procurement by any state, approximately 1,700 megawatts of offshore wind. NIPA is playing its role in supporting the state in reaching those objectives with our uh, partnership, minority partnership with uh, Ever Orsted and Eversource Energy in the construction of one of those, pro one of the two projects that were awarded, an 880 megawatt uh, power plant off of Long Island. You can see it here um, in the upper right, uh, the Sunrise Wind Project. What's very exciting, again, about that is uh, that, that we're working uh, in partnership with the private sector, and a, a great example of public-private partnerships with the private sector leading. Uh, we're capitalizing on our transmission expertise, and we'll be supporting the construction of the dry transmission. Hopefully, with our expanded authority, as, as Gil shared, we'll have an opportunity to go further afield into, into the waters in the future for, for, for other procurements. The Sunrise Wind Project is 880 megawatts. It will be connecting into Long Island. The anticipated commercial operation date is in 2024, and it's anticipated a construction will start in 2022. Clearly, we'll come back to you for specific approval around the investments that will be required as the project progresses and, and the agreements with uh, uh, Bay State Wind or State Eversource JV are, are set. But it's a very exciting. Uh, Clarify what, what our role and uh, yeah. what our responsibilities and the scope of our work right. will be, uh, Sarah, please. So, so we are focused on the dry transmission, so really only once on the ground, land, once they right? Land. Once they get it to land, essentially the interconnection there. Con Ed Transmission is also uh, a partnering in this project and will be responsible for the wet transmission. And then Orsted Eversource are focused on the generation assets, so the wind turbines and the infrastructure related to that. So it's a great, again, so Con Ed gets it from the project, project to, land, to land. We, we get did it, it from the land, land on and, land. Yes the distribution. Yes. Yes. Okay. And 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 our and our investment will be commensurate with um, the assets that we're supporting on the construction the geographic of geographic reach of the distribution will be the on land distribution will be what? Well, it will just be coming into the upgrades of of the substations and the okay. interconnection clearly um, going forward and that's something that's on 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 the docket for for all the entire utility industry is the supporting of the of the upgrade of the distribution and transmission grid to support nine gigawatts of of wind coming into into the system off of the coast okay and this would replace uh, fossil fuel generation of some kind or Yes, yes. I mean, it will be supporting the efforts uh, of the New York State to reach 2040 and have a completely decarbonized sector. Absolutely. But it's very, it's very, it's very exciting. 
Oh yeah, kudos again. I know you and your team put a lot of effort yeah. into uh, the, the whole proposal process and picking the right horse and right. all the rest of that, so well done. Yes, and I think again, it's, a, it's an excellent example of public-private partnership. We've seen that with the AC proceeding and other projects. We really would like to continue to capitalize on that model, bring NIPA's expertise to bear on the transmission side and support the overarching renewable goals. Terrific. What, what, what do they propose port facilities? What are, the, what are they consistent of? Yes. So as part of the as part of the uh, procurement uh, that NYSERDA put out, there was a request for essentially some economic development in support of offshore wind industry development. So the project itself is committing to ten million dollars in support of port infrastructure being developed in order to construct the unit the, the units as well as uh, workforce training so that that is another very large focus of of developing these projects is New York can become a hub for the offshore industry generally across the East Coast, both in terms of uh, development of, of infrastructure. Uh, there's an estimate of $32 billion, or um, uh, do I have it? Yeah, $3.2 billion in private investment and, and the development also of, of new jobs. $32 billion. I was going to say, I was, that's, that's, I was confusing well, it with the economic, I was like, that sounded a little high. I was like, that's just our economic development right, program. Right. <laughs> Any other questions for Sarah? Okay, super. Great. Yeah, well done, Sarah. Thank you. Keith, you've got a couple uh, resolutions for us to uh, weigh in on. I do. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, trustees, all in attendance today. As recommended by the Economic Development Power Allocation Board on July 16, 2019, the trustees are requested to approve 3.7 megawatts of Recharge New York power to the following. Four large business retention allocations totaling 1.6 megawatts, three large business expansion allocations totaling 1.1 megawatts, and seven small business and non-for-profit based allocations totaling one megawatt. These allocations would collectively support the retention and creation of over 4,500 jobs and 184 million of capital investment commitments. The balance of available recharge in New York power to award is approximately 146 megawatts, of which 50% uh, or 73 megawatts is hydropower. One way to replenish the, pro the program is through compliance action, which we spoke about earlier in the meeting. Um, the 14 allocations will be distributed to 13 customers throughout the state, and I always like to highlight one customer. Um, I'd like to highlight Bausch & Loam, located in <coughs> Rochester, New York, uh, who is adding a new manufacturing line for contact lenses. They're creating uh, 100 new jobs and investing, <coughs> excuse me, 148 million in capital investment for 600 kW. And the, the wages, the average wages for these jobs is about $58,000 per year, which is well above uh, the average. Way to go, Rochester, all right. All right. <laughs> so this item is, is submitted for your approval. I'd be happy to take any of your questions. So the mix uh, uh, retained and created on the 4,500 jobs, Bausch & Lomb's creating 100 new. How many other new jobs are being created? Uh, there's two other entities um, uh, creating an additional, let's see, 100 jobs also be cr being created by um, Island International Exterior Fabricators uh, located in Long Island and uh, Fieldtex Products, Inc., which is also in the uh, Finger Lakes, is creating uh, 30 new jobs as well. So 230, 230 new jobs, new jobs which is great. So the program remains to be uh, strong, vital, and uh, doing its thing across the state. I don't want to undersell, though, the retained jobs because no I think pressure. everyone That's knows right. that every single day, just as we were discussing, you know, the hits against our system from cybersecurity, other states are trying to recruit businesses out of New York. And so to keep those jobs there, especially in areas that might otherwise right. struggle to replace those jobs, Absolutely. is incredibly important. Absolutely. It's a great point. Any other questions for Keith? Otherwise, I'll we'll take the resolution separately. Can I have a motion to uh, approve as presented? So moved and seconded. Tony and the judge. Uh, any other questions? Otherwise, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Okay. 
This item requests that the trustees approve a 10,000 kilowatt allocation of replacement power to Somerset Operating Cor uh, Company, LLC, also known as SOC, which is proposing to develop the Empire State Hub, which would focus on artificial intelligence, machine learning, and other computationally intensive processes. The, this allocation would support the creation of 165 new jobs and a capital investment commitment of at least $85 million. The company plans to initially construct three server buildings at the site with operations anticipated to begin in the summer of 2020. This item also requests that the trustee auth trustees authorize a public hearing on the proposed contract for Somerset Operating Corp uh, Company, LLC. Again, this item is submitted for your approval. I'd be happy to take any questions. The jobs per kilowatt, capital investment, do they, how do they hold up relative to our historic benchmark? That's a great question. They are uh, lower than our historicals, but there are other factors that we've taken into account here. For instance, um, this is a 690 megawatt coal plant, um, consistent with the governor's commitment to eliminate all in-state coal generation by 2020. This project will secure the closure of a coal-fired plant. Uh, resulting in greenhouse gas uh, emission reduction of 5.3 million tons of CO2, which essentially takes about a million vehicles off the road annually. So we took that into account. We also took, took into account the closure of this plant would be devastating um, to, to the immediate area. So this is all, all positive. Um, there's about 62 jobs at the site now. So this is a big uptick in the yeah, job creation. Jobs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Keith, if I'm, if I'm not incorrect, if I'm not wrong, isn't that... It means uh, if you're right. Yes, if you're right. <laughs> if, That's uh, why you're a judge. If, you're right. <laughs> if it uh, also preserves, a, a, uh, has the potential to preserve a real estate base for real estate taxes in Absolutely. the community or county there. It should well. be a, a direct impact to the and community for sure. Uh, significant. And I, I didn't mention, I mean, the company is looking to be 100% renewable here and they're looking for NIPA to be their full requirements provider, which falls under our expanded authority. Okay. Is this their only presence there? Is there I'm sorry? Is, there, is this a new facility? It's, it's a no. New facility they... No, they've, they've been operating this facility for some time. I think they acquired it in, I want to say 2012. They also have the Cayuga plant as well, the last two coal-fired plants in the state. Any other questions for Keith? Otherwise, motion to approve. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, unless there's any other, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Well done, Keith. Good work. Super. All right, Joe. We got a plate full. <laughs> Starting with a positive dart rate. So. <laughs> I'll take it when I can get it, that's for sure. Twice, twice in five months. <laughs> yeah, we're very proud. Thank you, uh, Chairman, trustees, um, staff, and uh, the public watching. Uh, yeah, we're very proud of our uh, metrics. Uh, Gil did touch on it, and uh, of course, our dart rate we focus on quite a bit. It's all, uh, none of what we do comes at the expense of safety. So we're very proud of that uh, measure right now and hope to maintain that the rest of the year. The 99.5 marker readiness, I mean, that's. Uh, Test my memory. I mean, that's as good as it gets. It's right? as good as it gets. Um, that target is is we've had, we've had uh, on occasion missed our target in that area, as you know, over the years. So uh, we have some uh, headroom right now based on where we're performing, and uh, we're going to continue to make it. So it looks good. And our scheduled uh, transmission is scheduled and forced outages, and we're doing well there as well. Fabulous. So there are uh, three specific items that I want to talk about today. Um, that uh, are going to require some funding and some board approval here. So the first one is around the communications backbone. Uh, this is a part of our digitization strategy. Um, so what we have here is the uh, backbone uh, program is part of the Authority Smart Generation and Transmission Initiative. The program has been identified as one of the 2X programs, which is what we want to accelerate to get some of our uh, uh, communications going. And is, uh, as part of that, the scope is uh, installation of the optical ground wire, which is OPGW. That's the acronym there. So specifically, there are three transmission lines uh, that we're looking for uh, throughout each region. Uh, we want to hopefully uh, get this comms backbone in place for uh, 2021. Uh, will we be, with this money, uh, purchasing cable hardware for the transmission line segments above? which is going to be uh, NATL, CCRT, and um, uh, MSU lines. And uh, NIPA is requesting the trustees with this request to ratify a five-year, $93 million master service agreement contract uh, for four separate contractors listed there before JW Dodato, 
Hankels and McCoy, M10, and PIR electrical contractors. Um, these vendors were pre-approved and qualified based on capability, capacity, and experience, and the interim approval was received in July in order to release the mini bid for the NR2 line segment uh, that is, uh, uh, is hoping to start soon. So each line has a bid and rewards awarded separately. So a lot of language there. What it amounts to is that you had previously uh, approved in the, in the aggregate uh, the project the scope of all the comms backbone is about 153 million dollars we come to you occasionally to just get to fill that trench to make sure that we got some money to do this work and we're up to 100 million dollars that you previously approved of that uh, a small portion six million has been approved for start for starting this work this is the 93 million now to put a fleet of contractors in place it's not committing to spend the 93 right now. What it is is gives us the opportunity as the outages become available and as the scope becomes available, we can start allocating and, and mini-bidding these contracts to make sure we got uh, the resources to put it in place and get that communications going. Over how long a period of time? Do so um, I'm going I'm to go back to my five years, five years. Like if I brought my ringers with me this time. This specific, this specific service contract would be over a period of five years. Does each contractor have a five-year agreement? Are they separate? It's one. It's a, It's one agreement. So we would go to them, right? So it's one agreement with the five contractors. They all got uh, the ability to draw on each one of them, um, so that it's a master service agreement. So we would just uh, allocate certain. Um, when we go out for mini bids, it would depend on their own availability to do the work, and then we would just award it that way. Does anyone serve as a lead, or are they just? The no, owner? they're all equally weighted, right? Yeah, they'll, they'll have the opportunity to right. bid on specific scopes of work. And we did this as a, as a pre-qualification because mm -hmm. the work is so dangerous. We want to make sure we're dealing with the best companies out there. So we, we pre-qualified these firms, and then we do a mini bid amongst those firms to make sure we get competitive pricing. Yeah. If, if I could just add, what we're doing here is we're putting fiber optic lines on top of our transmission line. So we, we own a third of the transmission system in the state, about 1,400 circuit miles. So we're putting fiber optic, and that will be our communications backbone for our um, you know, digital initiatives here at NIPA. So we can, we can get all the information from the sensors and the meters, the control system of our power plants and substation to that backbone and bring it back here to our ISOC. To, for analysis, uh, down the line, it you know we're also looking at investing on a you know wireless network that will then input all of that data into this backbone. Uh, really, it's a it's a it's a kind of super highway of telecommunication for our sensors and meters, et cetera. So, would this also provide an additional capacity in the case of an outage, uh, generally speaking, throughout the state? Of it, you know, could it could it add additional capacity in terms of communication uh, yes. uh, pipeline? Um, it does have actually additional capacity than what we would use. Yeah. So, I mean, if if we're up, say Verizon and AT and T, right. they're completely down, and we're up. It's it's capacity, but it's capacity for our system, okay. you know, not for consumers. Gotcha. All right. So just in terms of sort of fiscal accountability, so the board is approving a $93 million top stop for this work um, with the understanding that across these providers, there'll be many bids to get the best pricing so that at the end of the day, we might not actually spend that's, actually, that's correct. million. That is correct. Um, but that we have a sense that that is the maximum exposure for this. Work. That's correct. So the, the overall, actually, we the, the budget that we estimate is about $100 million. This 93 represents the balance. You've already approved six to do some of the early work. And uh, so this is the balance. If those mini bids exceed the threshold, then we'd have to come back to you. We'd have to come back to you. And all I'd ask to build off of that is that, you know, we uh, receive regular reporting as to, you know, this is just typical of, and I think we're going to see more and more of it, you know, the, the larger projects and all the rest of that. So whether it's as a board, whether it's as a finance committee, et cetera, that there's just ongoing accountability <laughs> and uh, ongoing reporting and transparency as to the status of the projects and the work and the bids and what's encountered, good, bad, and indifferent, and, you know, all the rest of that, okay? Correct. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yep. All right, so we just... Uh, I don't want to be a cavalier about 93 million bucks over five years so uh just that we have you know an, an ongoing uh, dialogue yeah i think to reset the dialogue and the narrative to make sure that you you recall what uh what the preceding parts i will make sure we do that going forward okay 
you want me to go to the next item or no, do each one separate? With the benefit of that discussion, can I have a motion to approve? Second. Tony, thank you, Ian. Second. Any other discussion, questions? Otherwise, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Chairman. Next item we have is uh, for establishing a 20 megawatt uh, battery storage facility. We talked a little bit about battery storage and how that's part of our, our roadmap as well. Uh, so this is our, uh, really our first foray into uh, uh, the battery storage. And the background here is we're uh, hoping to have a storage system supply the nor northern New York, uh, well, the New York wholesale energy and ancillary service markets in general. It'll be stalled up at the Willis uh, substation or adjacent to it and contribute to the adequacy, economy, and reliability and uh, support the power supply system. Uh, this is an aggressive schedule. We're hoping for project completion in mid-2020. Uh, um, so the again, this is another one that we've uh, come to the board and, and gave an estimate of about $30 million um, for. You have previously approved a, a portion of that, $6 million. Uh, this is for a uh, capital authorization for $23.8 million. And that is for the addition to get up to that $30 million cap. But within that cap, what we're also looking for the board is approval of a three-year contract for O'Connell Electric or $25.6 million for the uh, implementation of this storage. This really aligns with I me mean, from a strategic initiatives and, and the like storage being a key element. This is, I won't say our first toe in the water or first foray, but it's, it's clearly uh, directionally in uh, the North Country where it's all the more relevant, right? So, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, and many of the wind farms are connected, the private sector owned wind farms are connected to our transmission system in the North Country. And there are uh, a lot, there are moments in time when there's just oversupply of electricity in that area from our hydro and from all of the wind farms. So what we're going to try and do is those moments where there's oversupply will store right. the because oversupply. The and then when there's a need, we then discharge and sell the oversupply to the market. So this could apply to excess hydro generation as could well? Could be, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, relative to the size of St. Lawrence, it's a relatively small storage facility uh, to that, but the idea is to learn from this and expand where we need it. A bit of a pilot project? Or? A bit, a bit. It's a, it's, a, it's a net positive right now in the way the market goes. We believe we're going to make money doing this. Um, right. So that's that's the good news, uh, but we are going to learn more about this. That's overall part of our flexibility moonshot, right? right, where we're essentially looking at integrating renewables, smoothing the supply, as well as, as a deferral of generation or transmission assets moving to the 2040 decarbonized sector. Right. And there, there's other practical learnings, too, around building a, a battery in terms of the protection, the uh, fire protection and things around that as well that we hope to gain from this as well. So there's a lot to learn here. So how much of this are we going to invest in terms of actual R&D in the pilot? And as technology increases and storage capacity increases, are we capturing some of that intellectual property that we're putting into this? Is that something that that NIPA is going to own going forward? Or yeah, yeah, that's something. I mean, this is this is our this is going to be our project. So this is going to be one of our assets in our. So everything we learn from this is going to be something that we own. So in, in any ways that we in, in prior, uh, you know, all of our strategy around these areas, we've in, we've involved other people like Epri that we talked about earlier before. So, you know, we share in some of these user groups some learnings as well, but in terms of intellectual property, that's all, that would be all ours. Judge, you want to make the motion? Sure, I'd be glad to. A second? Second. Okay. Um, any other I'm recused on this. Any other questions? All right. Uh, otherwise, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And uh, your recusal duly noted. And thank you. All right, Joe. Thank you, Chairman. One more item uh, from the uh, utility operations. Uh, so this is Transmission Life Ex uh, Extension and Modernization, or LEM. Uh, this is actually part of the entire program, the 726 that we've been talking about, uh, $726 million that we've been talking about over the years. This portion uh, is estimated at about $60.6 uh, .6 million. And you have previously uh, approved about 26.3. So we're coming after another 34 um, million dollars in support of this project. So what this is now is continuation of the transmission uh, LEM. So the scope here is actually some of the things that you're familiar with of the other parts of the LEM. It's going to be replacement of breakers, uh, relay systems, switches, and uh, three specific substations um, up north. So Willis substation will have uh, seven uh, 230 kV breakers, relay, and station service upgrades and uh, replacement of the 115 kV disconnects. Plattsburgh is going to have relay and station service upgrades as well. And, um, and Saranac substation will have uh, four new uh, 115 kV circuit breakers. So that's all within the, the balance of the $34 million being requested here. And so we're looking for your approval on that as well. 
Uh, and again, I just ask the same, you know, let's just get increasingly better at uh, the reporting and, and monitoring and the visibility that, you know, we see as uh, these dollars are deployed and the, and the work progresses. Right. We'll make sure that we're clear on that going right. forward. Okay. I would uh, move that. Mr. Uh, Judge, thank you. Tony, second. Uh, any other questions? Otherwise, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, Chairman. Aye, That's Chairman. all I had for that uh, report. A good day's work. Uh, uh, or a productive 15, 20 minutes at the podium. <laughs> I get the, right. get the staff here makes me look good. Right. So it's been a fair chunk of change there. Well done. <laughs> All right. Um, next stop is, what do we have? Uh, Committee, report. Committee reports. Committee reports, yeah. Well, you we're making good progress here. All right. Uh, yeah, we've had uh, all of our committees, uh, I think literally all of our committees, uh, we've had you know, a busy few weeks uh, uh, and uh, some more the, this morning as well. So uh, continuing uh, the dialogue and in this case, uh, Trustee McKibben, who chairs uh, our finance uh, uh, committee, is unable to be with us. So in her absence, uh, I'll probably end up reintroducing Joe uh, a bit. Good, I'm looking over here, but you didn't even bother sitting down. <laughs> I was instructed to stay, stay put. <laughs> well done. As you'll hear, um, a couple very significant projects, one uh, most notably, um, where as a committee, uh, we spent uh, a good amount of time and bringing forth a recommendation here uh, to spend some uh, significant uh, dollars uh, in our uh, in the Niagara uh, you know project uh, as well as others and while um, not one to typically replicate or duplicate uh, the efforts of the committee at the full board given the, the significance of uh, the, the expenditures uh, I've asked Joe for the benefit of uh, non-committee members to give us a bit of a, a drive-by again um, on the scopes of the projects and uh, the dollars involved. So, Joe. Absolutely. So the first item we have, there's uh, there's two items specific to um, uh, the Finance Committee um, that we sought their approval on and review. Uh, the first being a maintenance uh, agreement for the, uh, the Flynn Power Plant out on Long Island. So that's a long-term service and extended parts agreement. It's got a long acronym. We tried to get a longer one, but that's the best we could do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I don't. I say long-term extended uh, parts agreement. Um, so the background, the Flint, the Flint plant's been in service uh, since 1994. It's been a very uh, reliable plant for us. It's one of the cleanest plants on Long Island, so we're, we're very inspired to keep that uh, going. Uh, so we're securing a flexible, more affordable O&M agreement um, for the financial profile of Flint. So we're always trying to optimize the O&M, and we have agreements in place right now. So this is an extension and modification of a current agreement um, to make it more affordable. Uh, to operate the Flint power plant. So uh, this maximizes our own investments and continues to support NIPA's mission in the energy sector. And it's also in alignment with our asset management, reliability, centered maintenance, and other corporate initiatives around uh, uh, keeping the asset life cycle in mind. Uh, so this, when we talk about fossil fuel plants, we don't normally talk about frequency-based maintenance. We talk about uh, the number of run hours. So this is designed to get us through the next $100,000 of equivalent operating hours and they use equivalent operating hours because if it ran 100,000 continuously, that would be one thing, but starts and stops have impact. Of course, it doesn't run all the time necessarily based on market conditions and other uh, scheduled outages. So um, it, it's designed to get us through $100,000 of that. So the action for the trustees today is to approve the $45 million contract with Siemens uh, for the maintenance of the authority's Flint plant, uh, combined power uh, plant combustion and steam turbine. And Siemens is the, uh, the, the, OEM. The, the OEM on this, right? Yeah. So. Um, again, we spent a fair amount of time in, in committee uh, making sure we understood uh, the scope and nature of this. So uh, the committee uh, recommends uh, to the full board that uh, we approve uh, this contract. Um, so I'll make that motion on behalf of the committee. Uh, someone would second. Michael, Tony, thank you very much. Otherwise, other, unless there's other questions, to Joe, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, Chairman. And then we have now the big one with a B with a B. Uh, so we're very excited about this. This is the next uh, step in our, our life extension modernization. Again, following our asset management practices in the authority, uh, we're looking at a project uh, a program um, of a one point one billion dollars to do a life extension modernization of the one point one billion with a B uh, dollars for the completion expected through uh, twenty thirty four 
of uh, the control systems and some of the mechanical equipment at our Robert Moses Power Project. As you know, the Niagara Power Project is our, is our flagship. Uh, that's uh, very critical to the, the system. Uh, the New York ISO has found a number of different ways to use that plant for ancillary services, voltage support, black start. Uh, it's a critical uh, component of the entire system. So uh, this, uh, you may recall, we have invested in the, uh, the Niagara Power Project in a number of different ways. Back in the 90s, we did an upgrade. Uh, the scope of that upgrade was not life extension and modernization at that time. It was really designed to increase the capacity of the plant overall. In fact, there were designs and thoughts about actually adding a unit to that plant. But by cooling that plant and modifying the turbines and doing some other uh, mechanical infrastructure in that plant, we were able to, in aggregate, add about 200 megawatts of capacity in that plant. Um, so this is uh, now that we've done the, the life extension modernization at St. Lawrence, which was at the end of its life cycle cost. Then at Blenheim Gilboa, uh, you know about the Lewiston pump generating uh, station. We're doing that now in Niagara. And of course our transmission line, this is the next step in that. We have more information. We have more information uh, from analytics. Um, we have a lot of different ways of getting the data now. And we know now that starting this program uh, right now and working through 2032 puts us in a good situation where we're not at risk uh, for any imminent failures that could be catastrophic going forward. So uh, the request here is to approve uh, the, the Robert Moses Life Extension and Modernization Program. The estimated cost in aggregate over the 20 uh, through 2034 is $1.1 billion. And uh, we're looking uh, right now to authorize also the uh, capital funding in the amount of $213 million to approve a 14-year, $134 million contract with Burns & McDonald. They are going to work on our uh, integrated control systems and, uh, and also approve a 14-year, $69 million contract to State Group to design, fabricate, and install our, uh, uh, operate our Penstock platform. So the Penstock platform is required to go in and physically look at uh, these, these huge pen stocks, and there's a, a significant amount of safety uh, involved with that and technical competence that we feel we are very comfortable with State Group, and Burns and McDonald will be taking over the control systems over the 14-year uh, period. So the discussion that can be have, so this is an umbrella authorization of you know, 1.1 billion, 20% of it round numbers being specifically uh, you know, requested at this point in time. As you'd expect, complicated uh, initiatives, it was a complicated bid process, um, one, one of the processes was rebid. Uh, um, there's a lot of nuances uh, to this. Uh, uh, bidders uh, you know, scrutinized and evaluated. It wasn't necessarily a low bid wins. It was to ensure that we had the right uh, and high quality uh, you know, bidders here uh, as well. So we had a lot of discussion uh, around that. Frankly, the range of bids on one of the projects was uh, fairly wide uh, to ensure that we better understood the, you know, that dynamic, et cetera. So it's a real healthy debate and dialogue. The flip side was, was all right, my uh, ignorant uh, you know, analogy would be, is it worth uh, upgrading our existing car for $1.1 or should we buy a new one? And wanted to ensure that the returns on such a significant investment were appropriate. In fact, they were more than appropriate. Uh, and validated by outsiders uh, as well. So um, while the magnitude of this project is uh, more than uh, significant, we as a committee uh, feel very strongly in full support of management's recommendation that it's uh, uh, the right step to take and uh, further underscores the efficiency of uh, the Niagara Power Project and uh, uh, its benefits to us as an organization. That said, questions, comments uh, for Joe. In context, uh, Joe, th this is a 60-year-old project or thereabouts, right? That's right. And, uh, you know, the investment we're uh, authorizing here today is, you compare it to what the cost of building right. new, and uh, it's, yeah. a, it's a good investment. It would, it would be, uh, it's to, compared to building, I don't think you could achieve it, actually, build the Niagara Power Project today. The analysis so. that was done, Judge, more than, more than substantiated right. that. Yeah. Frankly, the returns... Um, I'm, you know, <laughs> they, they were significant. Yeah, 40% IRR right. and, uh, right. yeah, significant uh, uh, net present value. In see the plan of 40, you know, 40, 40 plus percent return on our investment there. Well, and I think that's the value of the asset as it exists today. It's something you cannot replicate. Right. Right. That's exactly so right. A billion dollars is a lot of money, but to replicate that asset 
it would be multiple factors of a billion. Right. Oh, exactly right. Right. If you don't do it. And if you don't do it, there's yeah. the, the significant risk around that. And we've actually learned a lot. I mean, there's case studies out there um, of failures of, of head covers that are very uh, tragic and, and devastating to systems or if you internationally. Or if you delay it any longer. Right. So if we, if we, if we delay it any longer, we're, we're, we're feeling we're putting ourselves at risk at the, that kind of Part failure. Part of the complication of this, and correct me if I'm wrong, is um, this is it's, nothing's being shut down to be modern. Now, this is you'll change in the fan belt while you're driving 60 miles an hour down correct. the throughway. You know, we're, we're continuing to operate and run uh, the plant at a high level and a high performance level while it's being upgraded. So that's part of the complication and part of the cost impact to ensure it doesn't compromise uh, the delivery of our services. And uh, even from a pure pure reliability standpoint as well. So that's another another aspect of it is we're able to provide all the ancillary services that we provide doing this work because we are able to take one unit out of commission to do this work, another one potentially for maintenance and still maintain those uh, ancillary services. There is a, uh, just for the benefit of the, the broader um, um, uh, board now. Um, we have the program scope and cost estimates uh, slide if you need any more detail on that or questions on that and a little bit on the program schedule. I think in earnest we'll get started. Uh, well, we'll get on the platform fabrication as early as this year, um, but in earnest in 2020 we'll get it rolling on some of this work. Uh, yeah, as we've said, you'll provide us regular updates yes, uh, along on the way. an ongoing basis as Correct. sad as this. But again, not to you know minimize anyway, I mean a billion one infrastructure project is one of the largest. Uh, if not the largest. That, you know, the and state maybe will, in our history, in the history right. of NIPA, aside from building a new plant, right? Sure. Right? So uh, very notable and uh, something you know we we're, we're proud of as well as excited about. So, yeah, very excited. It's a good time to be. Any other questions? Again, the committee recommends uh, full board approval. So on behalf of the committee, happy to make uh, that motion. How are we paying for this? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm actually going to have to defer to my my team to talk about all the what uh, the the financing on this. So I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate some things that have been said, just so finance can, can weigh in on this. The returns on this from an economic, there's all types of metrics that can be looked at. It's, uh, it's a good project under any number of them. Specifically from a finance perspective, these are the types of investments we'd like to do day and night. Uh, quite frankly, we believe this is highly financeable in the market. We would finance this over time with some operating cash flows, maybe our cash flow reserves, uh, but we anticipate part of it being going out to the market with tax exempt debt. What's the life expectancy once the work is done, Gail? Uh, we're, we're actually, the target on this is we relicensed in 2006 for a 50 year license to 2056, and our target is that this is going to be a good work of service through that licensing period. Did you get a second? I didn't yet, second. so I'm waiting for my second. Go All right. Second. Okay. Um, any other questions? All right. Otherwise, then. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Thanks very much, Joe, for the recap and the refresh, and appreciate everyone's support. All right. Uh, next up, Judge Chairman and Audit Committee meeting a couple uh, weeks ago. Yes. Uh, again, a full agenda there. So uh, report out for us, please. Okay. We uh, the, the Audit Committee met at a special meeting on July 9th. Uh, we adopted a consent agenda that included the minutes and charter amendments and uh, the committee meeting charter. There were no changes to those charters, but the uh, board's approval is requested in order to be in compliance with uh, auditor standards. Uh, the committee received an inter internal update from Angela Gonzalez and Lee Garza, uh, provide, and they provided an overview of a recently concluded request for uh, uh, proposals process associated with the procurement of external audit services. In June, uh, management conducted a competitive public process to secure additional auditing services, given that a five-year contract under which NIPA currently, uh, current auditor KPMG is set to expire this year, uh, third quarter, uh, received multiple responses to the RFP, and after a thorough uh, evaluation of the proposals, including interviews with the, the respondents. Uh, management identified KPMG as having submitted the strongest proposal based upon several factors as sector experience, experience with companies similar to NIPA, management experience, audit approach, and value for cost. The committee therefore recommends to the full board, auth board authorize a five-year procurement contract with KPMG for external audit services valued 
at $3 million. That's a five-year contract. Uh, the committee also recommends the adoption of the NIPA Canal Committee Charters and the NIPA Internal Audit Charter. Those two, uh, three items are uh, one, two, and three on the agenda. Uh, one is the independent accounting services, which I just mentioned for $3 million. Do you need separate resolu one motion is uh, resolution? Second one is um, uh, power, the authority and, and canal corporation audit committee charters. And finally, the uh, internal audit committee charter. And I'd ask that those three items be approved as one. Also, you'll, so you'll make the motion on behalf of the committee. I'm happy to second that. So, do. Yeah. so before I call for the vote, questions of uh, the judge, again, RFP process. We've got, uh, frankly, all the big four, four firms involved here. So our, in the earlier approval and consent agenda, we've got PwC, ENY, and Deloitte uh, participating on a consulting basis. So KPMG here on the compliance side. So um, yeah, pleased with uh, the outcomes of yes. that. Angela's team continues to evolve and grow, and uh, uh, we're on track and you know performing well. So let's let's any other questions. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All three motions uh, carried. Anything else? No, I I would just say that as part of the internal audit, uh, they're doing a survey that uh, the chairman and I participated in, and and uh, we hope to get some good feedback from mm -hmm. that and. Uh, be able to move onward. Yep. Provide an update at the uh, next audit committee. Right. So, great. All right. And this morning, uh, Mike chaired uh, our uh, latest uh, Cyber and Physical Security Committee. So, give us a quick update there. Uh, today, this, the Cyber and Physical Security Committee heard about the various methods and opportunities the security team has used to teach everyone about their role in cybersecurity, specifically focusing on one individual who did an outstanding job in preventing a phishing attack. Mm -hmm. uh, that was obviously uh, a model phishing attack, not a real one. Uh, the committee then also heard examples of how security awareness has played an important role in protecting NIPA generally. And we've also discussed uh, that NIPA is participating with some Israeli cybersecurity firms that have been, been included in a recent announcement by Governor Cuomo providing very unique technology capabilities for NIPA and just overall and this is a lean forward um, group here at on cybersecurity taking into account all the different threats that unfortunately are targeting US um, uh, utilities I continue very impressed with uh, the high quality of the work and it's one of those don't want to talk too much about it uh, but you know, knock on wood but yeah well, well done and mm -hmm. appreciate your leadership in that area Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, last but not least, we also uh, had a governance committee report uh, with an exciting uh, motion and announcement. So, Absolutely. Ann, our so, chair. Um, the governance committee met this morning in a special meeting to consider the appointment of Adam Barsky as the executive vice president and CFO of the Authority and Canal Corporation. Mr. Barsky most recently served as chief of staff and special counselor to the executive director at the Port Authority, and from 2006 to 2017, he served as the executive vice president, treasurer, and chief risk officer for the Israel Discount Bank of New York. He has served in a number of governmental capacities throughout his career and has extensive experience in working at the state and local levels. And as we discussed, we all had a chance to meet Mr. Barsky, review his, um, his experience, his resume, hear from him about the excitement that he has to join NIPA and a lot of it around some of the activities we were talking about today. So the governor committee voted to recommend his appointment to the full board effective immediately and that motion is now before the board for consideration and all, I'm happy to second uh, that motion and unless there's any other discussion ask uh, all in favor of Adam's appointment say aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed motion carried and Adam officially aye. welcome aboard Any brief acceptance speech or, uh, you know, or, or pearls of wisdom out of the gate? Uh, two weeks, I'll hit the ground running and hopefully get things uh, up and going as soon as possible. I'm well, very excited for this opportunity and just even sitting through the meeting today, so many exciting projects going on. So uh, it's really uh, an incredible opportunity. So thank you all. Thanks very much for signing up and signing on. We look forward to working with you. All right. And, uh, 
lastly, we have uh, a couple uh, long tenured and uh, critically important uh, employees who are uh, moving forward with the next chapter of their, of their lives, and we want to give uh, due recognition. So, so uh, I'm actually here to present Ed Ryder, who uh, is not going to be able to make it today, uh, a resolution that uh, was printed out for him. and. Uh, do we want to take a picture and yeah, just pretend that we can crop them in later, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> can Photoshop it in. Yeah, that'd be great. Can, can you can Photoshop it in? Yeah, let's do that. Photoshop it in. Wait, we'll pretend. Yeah. We'll leave some space for Ed to Photoshop. <laughs> Will he fit there? Is that okay? Uh, <laughs> there you go. Be tight. All right, get ready. <laughs> <laughs> um. I won't, I won't read the entire resolution. There are nine whereases on this thing. Um, Ed is worthy of... He did a hell of a job. He, he did w way many more than nine, nine whereases. But I do want to acknowledge in case, you know, my image of him right now is with some zinc oxide on his nose on a boat with a laptop watching the trustee meeting right now. Um, so I think that's probably what he's doing. Uh, <laughs> part of it's probably right. But we'll, we'll leave you to guess which it is. But Ed, uh, incredible engineer. Um, a real leader uh, up in northern New York. I, I met, I'm almost 20 years at the New York Power Authority, and I met Ed uh, at Niagara in 2001. Um, he was mid-career, I didn't know at that point. I mean, the guy's been here for, for a long time. Um, solid as the day is long, he did a lot to, to help the safety program at uh, Messina when he became regional manager there over the years. Um, and he's been an incredible mentor to everybody. He, there's not many assignments that he has not taken on uh, when asked. He's relocated a number of times for the Power Authority. He has a diverse experience, and he is not at all um, adverse to uh, sharing his, his knowledge with everybody and has uh, won many uh, mentorship awards here uh, in recognition. So he's been incredible. And I consider him a dear friend. Um, I, I do want to offer, I don't know, Judge, if you want to, uh, you, you yeah. work with Ed quite a bit, but Messina. I do, and uh, I, I would... Uh... You know, just like to highlight what a dedicated employee he has been for the power authority. As you mentioned, he's willing, been willing to go any place and do anything. Carries a lot of knowledge. It's a lot of uh, uh, institutional information that's walking out the door. But I'm sure he'd be glad to impart it to anybody that asks. So uh, exactly, it's, uh, it's a good. Uh, Resolution for and so the, the final part of the resolution says, so now therefore be it resolved that the trustees of the Power Authority in the state of New York convey their deepest gratitude, respect, and appreciation to Ed Ryder for his service to NIPA and the people of the state and wish him, his wife Jennifer of 30 years, their children and grandchildren a happy, healthy, and rewarding future. So. Thanks, thanks Joe. And then Gil. Yeah. Um, I have one more special recognition. Uh, we have one more special recognition. In fact, Deborah, if I could ask you to come up while I uh, say a few words about you and embarrass you. Uh, Deborah is and has been a special member of the NIPA, the NIPA family. Uh, she's been with us for 39 years. She started at 12, right? <laughs> Very good. Well, she started in, in June 1980 uh, and really rose through the ranks through our um, procurement and, and strategic supply management group as a scheduling clerk. She then started managing our MWB program, our supplier diversity program, since 1999, up to about a year or two ago, really mm -hmm. until now. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I want to tell you that you've really played a big role in that program. In fact, this year, since we're talking about billions today, our supplier diversity program under your leadership recently passed the one billion mark in MWBE spending. And, but I think the most important thing that you've done in that uh, in that group is not just the spending and, and having a robust MWBE program, but I've always seen you work with those companies to increase their capacity yes. and to look for new MWBE companies who can participate in our 
program, which is really fantastic. So, um, you know, we, we are just so grateful to your service to NIPA and to the people of this state. And, you know, you're, you're, you're just the best, simply the best. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, and again, you're reported on many times with us. Yes. We appreciate mm -hmm. all you've done here on behalf of the board. Thank you for you know, Thank your you. great service and great work. Thank you. Thank you. Alrighty. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, that concludes uh, our agenda for the day uh, assuming there's no other matters that uh, come before us our next meeting will be september 25th uh right back here in white white plains same time same station and uh in the meantime stay cool enjoy the remainder of uh summer uh the kickoff of uh, football season go bills go jets <laughs> oh, go Giants. Giants. whatever Giants. your loyalties may be and i would otherwise ask for a motion to adjourn so moved. so moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you for your time and attention.